Hello and welcome to About Books. Coming up on this edition, Jerry Smith speaks with Sean Street about his new poetry collection, Camera Obscura, and we meet children's author Rachel Braddock. First tonight, Sean Street. Sean is a writer, a broadcaster and a poet. He's also emeritus professor at Bournemouth University and now lives in Liverpool. Sean started his working career as an actor and this great love extended into works for the stage. His other great passions are for radio and poetry. Having worked as a practitioner in the radio sector since 1970 for both the BBC and independent radio, Sean's published poems pick up where the radio programmes ended. With 11 collections of poems behind him, including poems of earth and sky, a walk in winter, time between tides, Camera Obscura is his latest collection. He spoke with Jerry Smith recently to tell us more. Hello and welcome to About Books with me, Jerry Smith. Joining me today is Sean Street, who some of you may remember uh, I spoke to last year in relation to another one of his books. But today uh, we're going to be talking about one of his, uh, his latest book, uh, a book of poetry called Camera Obscura, published only this week by Rockingham Press. Hi, Sean. You're very welcome. Thank you, Jerry. So, Sean, um, I managed to get proofs of this um, before. I know it's only been published this week, so I've been reading it and enjoying it for the last couple of weeks. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, how it came about and uh, what this particular collection is, is kind of oriented towards? Uh, this book comes out just uh, coincidentally, uh, a couple of weeks ahead of my 70th birthday, so perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the, the, the main themes in the collection, I suppose, are, are memory, time and space and the book contains five sections and, and those five sections deal with with those themes in, in various ways. Uh, uh, the poems have been written over the last uh, three or four years I suppose so it's, 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 it is in a sense coincidental that it's come together uh, mm -hmm. at this point but, but perhaps quite fortuitous. One of the things I noticed when I was reading the book that there seems to be a number of occasional poems or kind of personality poems poems uh, oriented towards very specific events which sent me to Google to try and find out what's he talking about here and the the first poem the art of falling slowly was just such one but, but perhaps you might be able to read it uh, for us and tell us a little bit about it yeah I, I think a number of the poems uh, are, are as you say occasional poems and and perhaps do require uh, a certain amount of, of, of knowledge, maybe, uh, but hopefully, you know, given given the technologies we have now, that's not too far away. Mm. Uh, and a number of them are also of local themes. Uh, and the art of falling slowly is is about a local theme, and it's 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 based on a true event which happened at. Uh, Liverpool Speak Airport uh, in May 1956, when the uh, the aviator, parachutist, and and birdman Leo Valentin uh, fell to his death during a, an air display. Um, his his ambition was to was to simulate bird flight as best he could, and he he did it quite successfully on a number of occasions. But unfortunately, on that occasion, he met disaster. But it's also, there's also a metaphor in here. I mentioned my my brush with three score years and ten and I suppose the art of falling slowly is about living out your life as well mm. and uh, I, a number of my friends have as it were plummeted to earth too early so so I, I that's 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 the sub theme of this poem the art of falling slowly is not easily acquired it's all about observing the closer I come the less I see Desiring it as trees strive towards dancing, our flying shapes these descending variations, confusing more detail all the time in a picture frame that gets faster as it gets bigger. It's a presumption to be bird, to be angel, sky concealing the lost avian dream. In the end, as I reach out for it, it's a nothingness blurring to black, and then exploding. No such thing as a fixed horizon, but the grace of light held for a moment the art of it. I call that an occasional poem, but of, of course there is a kind of organic uh, movement across the whole collection. 
and, and Val Valentin was a bird man, and birds, I think, feature throughout the collection as well. Can you tell us about your interest in that? Yes, well, uh, birds and natural history. Um, the first section of the book uh, probably focuses more than any on, on natural history. Mm. Um, birds and the strangeness, the, the strangeness of species. The, the book's about communication um, as much as anything, and our desire to communicate with one another across barriers, and some of those barriers are the barriers of species. I mean, for example, there's a poem in here, a friend of mine is, is, is Richard Maybe, and Richard Maybe and I used to be near neighbours in the Chilterns. And both of us had a similar experience where we, we had a brush with a monk jack deer, which is, is a kind of deer that particularly inhabits the Chilterns. And we both realised there was a sort of strangeness between species. You can look into the eyes of a creature mm. and feel close to it, and yet as I think I say in one of the poems, you can name, but you can't know fully. Yeah. And, and that goes for birds as well. They're so close to us, um, they surround us, and yet there is that kind of uh, strangeness that we will never know. Um, and here we are in, in, in the Central Library, and just a floor down from us is the, the great uh, book of American birds, a uh, wonderful book if nobody's seen it. Please come and see it. It's a, it's it's worth seeing by Jean-Jacques uh, Audubon, mm. and there's a poem in 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 the book called Audubon, which uh, refers to the book. But when I was looking at the pictures, and that's what everybody sees in that book, uh, I I was fascinated by his descriptions, he, his his written descriptions of the pictures and the birds, which are very poetic. Mm. And uh, so I've I've. I've used, I've utilised, if you like, uh, appropriated some of the words from his descriptions of the birds into a lament from the birds for him because I was touched by the fact that when Audubon died in the 1850s, uh, the, of all things, he died of what we now call Alzheimer's. You know, he contracted Alzheimer's towards the end of his life and, and died at the age of 65, which is no age. And I was very moved by that, and uh, for a man who could create such precision in his his art and and such uh, love for the birds that yeah. he he celebrated. So, yes, uh, birds and the people who uh, who relate to them. I suppose they are kind of locked into a strangeness uh, of experience, aren't they? I mean, I, I, I li live in Hoylake, where the birds come come down from. The, the north and they they kind of roost in their millions thousands on on the beach before moving on and you've got a poem called field fairs which is kind of a similar experience um you know where have they come from where have they been that's the absolutely yeah, the magic of them isn't it they the suddenly appear and, and uh mm -hmm. field fairs uh yeah. that, that that inhabit for a, a brief time the field at the back of my my garden mm -hmm. uh, and coming down from the baltic uh yeah. and vacating the Baltic for us, and and suddenly filling a space here, and mm. uh, so I'm sort of occup occupied in my mind, I suppose, by not just the creatures, but the spaces they inhabit and the, the spaces they vacate as well. I speak the spaces they inhabit now is that your suburban back garden in Liverpool, which again, this is a, there's a, that's a theme running throughout the collection, isn't that your experience of living in this in this city? Um, uh, is, is re and, and the lead leading on to the Calder Stones uh, central section of, of the poem, yeah. uh, of, of the collection. Yeah, there's the central long poem is called The Calder Stones, and I live just down the road from Calder Stones Park. And uh, as soon as I moved there, I became very, very fascinated by the f these ancient stones, you know, as old as the pyramids, as old as Stonehenge. Uh, I mean, if they were on a, on a hillside in Wiltshire, there'd be coach loads of Americans going to see them. Uh, they're in a suburban park, and, and people sort of walk past a glass house and miss them. Mm. And yet they have these extraordinary prints on them uh, from 5,000 years ago. And I, I became very moved by that, the fact that these stones occupy a space more or less equidistant between John Lennon's house and Paul McCartney's house and my, and my house. Mm. And here am I trying to make marks on a page. And here are these stones from 5,000 years where somebody made marks to communicate. So the central poem is, is very much about trying to communicate with a like mind, hopefully, across time and across space yeah. uh, and, and, and striving to do that. And one of the principal uh, forms of communication that you, you're interested in in, in, in your, your career as a broadcaster and as an academic and as, now as a poet as well is sound, mm -hmm. isn't it? 
Yeah. And that's another theme that runs throughout the collection in a very kind of subtle, but deep and extraordinary way. Yeah, well, uh, when we last spoke on this program, we talked about a, a book I wrote called, the, a prose book called The Memory of Sound. And in, in a sense, a lot of these poems come out of uh, some of the preoccupations that I explored in, in that book. Mm. And, and rightly, as you say, music is very much a part of that because music is so much a part of our, the memory we carry with us, for, you know, part of our generational memory. Mm. Uh, there's a poem called uh, Music Radio, which is very much about the radio we carry in our heads from our, our, uh, our childhood and our, our teenage years. You know, I, I think it's interesting that... that the, 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 the music that you absorb between the ages of about 13 and 21 is the music that will probably inhabit most of your life. Yeah. And it's the music you... It's, the, it's your own playlist that you carry with you. And, is, it, is it Radio Caroline you're writing about in that poem? Or it's Radio poem? Caroline yeah. and, and, and offshore radio generally because I'm of a generation that, that used to sit on the east coast of England uh, away from my my school in Bedford and, and flash headlights out to sea and be yeah. delighted when you've got a, a, a DJ saying, hi, we get your message. So, yeah, I mean, it is, it's about nostalgia, but it's about that time of, the, the time you carry with you. And is the three score and 10 years anything to do with the kind of, uh, the uh, leaning towards the blues uh, in the final section? Well, it is. I mean, the, the, the final section is very much about that. I mean, there's a, pro a poem called The Ninth Symphony in there, which, which is a sonnet, which talks about Bruckner, Mahler and Schubert, um, because they all sort of were superstitious about the Ninth Symphony. And uh, this is my ninth collection. So it's three score years and ten in mm. the Ninth Symphony. Yeah, maybe, you know, don't get too close to that one. But yeah, the blues, uh, I grew up at a time when the blues revival was huge in Britain. And the last section in the book is called 12 Bars, and it's 12 poems of 12 lines about 12-bar blues. Uh, and, John, before we finish, you, you, you're going to have a launch, aren't you, in, in Coldestones Park itself. Can you tell us about that quickly? Yeah, it's on the 12th of May. It's in the uh, stable block at Calderstones Mansion. It starts at 7 o'clock with a tour of the Calderstones, a guided tour, and then a reading from Camera Obscura. You're, you're going to be reading um, some of the poems themselves? Including yeah. the Calderstones yeah. poem, yeah. Well, that sounds um, fantastic. I hope many people can make it along. And um, thank you again for coming along. It's a, this is a Camera Obscura. It's a really wonderful collection. Um, and uh, I hope you go on to write many, many more. Rachel Braddock is a local children's author. Her work includes the popular selling Catullus the Caterpillar, Ariana Armadillo, Caractacus Cat, Henrietta Hen and many others. Her stories create very distinctive worlds of their own with mischievous characters and glorious illustrations. We visited Rachel at home where she told us more. Well, I'm Rachel Braddock and I'm the author of the Bold Beast series of books. Now we usually say that these are books for children between the ages of uh, two up till about nine or ten but that depends on the child uh, it depends very much on whether they're read to or whether they're able to share books at home um, and their ability uh, their ability in, in English if they're from if the English isn't their first language then it would take a bit longer for them to be able to to read and hopefully enjoy them um, my background is that I am a teacher. Um, I, I have, most people say I have a passion for books in the English language. I do adore the English language. I love the way that, what, or what you can actually express in it. Particularly, I want children to, I suppose, feel like I do. Um, I want them to enjoy particularly the alliteration, uh, the assonance, the rhyme, um, the uh, all aspects of it, and particularly the expansion of their vocabulary, and therefore expanding their ability to use the English language. Um, as regards bold beasts. I suppose they really started when we learned that we were going to become grandparents. 
Now that was a good 10 years ago. Um, I really, really wanted to write stories for this impending child. Uh, and I did. I wrote about 36 to 40 of them. I just couldn't stop. Um, they haven't all been illustrated or published yet. We're hopeful. Um, they are illustrated by a very, one of my oldest friends named Joy Rutherford. This is the first one. Can tell us the caterpillar. He is the only one that doesn't rhyme. The rest are all written in rhyme. Uh, he was the very first one. And uh, this perhaps gives you some idea of the standard of illustration which I suppose I'm biased but I do think is at the very highest. Um, we, when we got some of them ready for publication we tried a number of different authors who, with whom, who we thought would be interested in them um, and to our disappointment they weren't. So after two or three years of, of this process we decided that we'd have to become self-publishing and um, so that was what happened and we decided that these books were going to be called were going to all come under the generic title of bold beasts who are brave boisterous and bad um, we engaged the services before they, they got to this stage of um, a book designer called Mike March and we liaise very closely with Mike March and hopefully we'll continue to do so because so far it's been a very very successful partnership. Um, now as regards marketing they can be found in independent bookshops which unfortunately are a dying breed um, but we've got them into Use From Nowhere in Bold Street, uh, in Lingham's, which is uh, on the Wirral, and also Right Bite, which is a fairly new um, bookshop uh, in Ainsdale. We also sell them in venues uh, in Chester, uh, the City Walls Cafe uh, is uh, stocks our, our books uh, and also Black, Blackwell's here uh, attached to the, uh, uh, the university is interested in taking them and we're hoping to pursue that. So there are a range of outlets um, and obviously we're hoping to expand them. One of our latest books is uh, concerns a lot of local matter. Uh, it's Esquire the Squirrel who lives on the Wirral at the top of a very tall tree. Um, and I wanted to emphasize this one because it concerns all the a lot of local history and a lot of local information which I hope will be of interest to readers of all ages. So it's, it's one of the latest and it's there for buying hopefully and enjoying. The Oxford Street News um, shop in uh, in Oxford Street obviously, very close to the university. Um, a very nice man there by the name of Anwar promotes our books and sells them. Uh, Marmalade Skies, which is a children's play facility, very and uh, with uh, very much parents involved, and that's at the uh, in the Allerton Road area. And also the staff at Left Aris. Um, a lovely Greek restaurant uh, which we often uh, visit and they have been very very helpful in promoting and buying the books for their children and, and 
friend and children of friends. The final way in which we're trying to market the books is that Robert, the publish, the publisher, is working with Mike March, the book designer, to update our website and make it possible to buy Bold Beasts online. As a person who loves the English language and wants other children and other readers, I won't define age, um, to appreciate and, and love it as I do, uh, all these books contain rhyme, rhythm, um, extension of vocabulary and all the things that are important when trying to teach literacy to children as per the government gu guidance. People often ask me where my ideas come from and I have to honestly answer that I have not the slightest idea. They simply arise when I've got a quiet moment, if I get a quiet moment, um, and it's this business of, in my head, the rhyme and the way things sound. Um, and then, as fast as I can, everything else just goes, I scribble it all down. And then I give it a day or two to mature and gel, if that's the right word. Um, and then I work on alterations, extensions, and at that stage I read it to, or I show it to Joy, um, and she immediately gets the ideas for the illustration. It's not an easy process, but with the determination to publish them, we hadn't any option. Because as the uh, publishers whom we thought might be interested, to our disappointment, were not. <coughs> but there are advantages as well. We can do what we think is right and appropriate and what we're happy with. We're not at the behest of um, other publishers who have other agendas. So it's there are pros and cons as with most things in life. Um, the marketing about which I've just spoken and of course which I which follows on is the most difficult process but it's it's very, very engaging and very interesting. Thanks for watching About Books. We'll see you next time.